I do. <laughs> Somewhat self interested, but yeah. On Mondays. Wait, did I see that one? Okay. It's only on Monday. Is it a time? All right, welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, so good to see you all. And just to. Uh, Janice asked a question a minute ago. Uh, so the first amendment class I'm teaching in the spring, it's the same case book. Oh. Well, no, well, so actually, so, so it, it's Mondays from 540 till 740. Um, we actually sell a paperback version of this book if you want to buy another one. We sell two paperback versions, basically the first half of the book in paperback and the second half book in paperback. But if you already have this book, the red one, you can use it again. It's the same exact book. We just sell it half for people of Common Law 1 and Common Law 2. So it's for the combination. So I hope to see all of you again this spring. Yes, ma'am. What's your conflict? A couple of you were able to take it, weren't you? Oh, oh I see. Well, I, I, <laughs> I was able to make a change. So actually, I did make one change. It was originally conflicting with civil uh, criminal procedure. And I got them to move my class up five minutes and corn back five minutes. I got a five minute move. I can't, I can't get you to have a mandatory class, my friend. I'm sorry. I, I adore you, but I can't pull that much weight. I can't. I am still the youngest person in the faculty. The, the, for, I've been here seven years. Nothing's changed. Uh, I, I had one student who matched it out of us saying she wants to defer property, but I will. I don't. It happened once. That's all I can say. She wanted to take a patent class, and she deferred my property class to take a patent class. And I'd never happened before, but one student did it this year. She cut my property class and took patent law. So it, it, it happens, but you know, that, I'm going to leave it there. Hmm. <laughs> I might be teaching property in the summer, though. It's possible. You might have me again. I don't know. It, 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 it's a possibility. I don't know. Having, uh, I don't know. Oh, it'll be property too. Maybe in the summer. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I did, believe it or not, I don't get my schedule to like, you get it, right? Like, I only learned a couple weeks ago that what my actual schedule is going to be. So they give you very little notice. But it doesn't come out in far enough to plan for spring. So it's I have a rough idea, but they don't tell me for sure until like a couple weeks ago. Yes, that's all right, all right, enough, enough. Okay, enough. So you're in my class now and you're stuck here, so I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> You can't, you can't leave, you're stuck. Um, are there any questions, anything on your mind? Anything, we did a lot last class and I, um, I apologize for moving so quickly, but it's, it's why we need six hours of con law. Anything on Buck v. Bell or West Coast Hotel or Caroline Products or uh, Williamson against Lee Optical or the Milnot case, anything in your minds? Yeah, Noel. Um, I was wondering if you could Clarify the definition of an originalist. Oh boy, uh, I'd be happy to. <clears throat> an originalist. Um, so there are different approaches to interpreting the Constitution. Um, no single judge ever adheres to a philosophy 100% of the time. And I'll make that point fairly clear. Most judges use um, different approaches to judging to different degrees, right? So one approach to judging might be what's called, you know, type. Uh, and I swear this was not a planted question, so I didn't know this was coming. Purposivism. 
What's purposivism? It's an awfully hard word to say. Um, the judge tries to figure out what the intent of the people who wrote the law was. You know, what did they intend? Right? The purpose of a statute, for example. Um, another approach might be called textualism, right? This approach says we don't really care what the intent of the framers was. We care what the meaning of the word is, right? What are the meaning of the words that they used? And very often, intent leads perhaps one way, and textualism perhaps leads another way. And I think I know why Noel asked the question today. Um, Brown, I think, is uh, perhaps one of those cases where if you look at the text of the 14th Amendment and if you look at the text of the various civil rights acts passed in that time, um, it's pretty clear that equal protection meant equal protection. But if you look at the intent, perhaps, of some of the people who were at the time, what they said, they were okay with various forms of segregation. So uh, Brown might be one of those cases where <clears throat> focusing on the purpose or the intent of framers might cut one way, and focusing on the meaning of the text they enacted, which I think was a lot broader, might go the other way in the school segregation issue. Now, Noel didn't ask me what textualism was. He asked me what originalism was. And they're very close. They're related, to make it simple enough. Um, originalism, as it's largely understood today, uh, refers to understanding how the text of the Constitution was understood at the time that it was ratified. So if we want to ask what's the original meaning of the Commerce Clause, we'd ask how was commerce understood in the 1790s. If you want to know the meaning of the 14th Amendment, well, that didn't exist in the 1790s, so you'd ask how were phrases like due process or equal protection or privileges or immunities understood in the 1860s, right? Um, so these are broad theories of how courts interpret provisions of the Constitution. Um, judges use mixes of these approaches. For example, you'll recall in the slaughterhouse cases, and in Cruikshank, these sorts of cases, that, well, the purpose of the 14th Amendment was to free the, uh, liberate the freedom and give them rights, and that was it, right? Didn't help Meyer Bradwell, didn't help anyone else, right? That is an element of original intent. Or if you look at Tawney's opinion, maybe in Dred Scott, they say, well, the, the intent of the Constitution was to have, you know, the, the sl uh, slaves as a different race, totally unknown to us. Well, that sort of intent perhaps can't be found in the text. So there's a huge divide among people over are you a textualist, do you follow purpose? And the dirty secret is judges tend to mix and match. I think the only person, oh, Justice Thomas is the probably most self-professed originalist on the court. Uh, Justice Scalia claimed to be, though he was what he called a faint-hearted originalist. He would do it in some cases. But the difficulty with all these theories is you always have the role of precedent, right? That is stare decisis. And what happens where you have a precedent that was not originalist, and then you have an originalist answer that goes the other way. Um, Justice Thomas is somewhat unique in that he'd be willing to overturn vast amounts of precedent to follow the original meaning of the Constitution. Look at his opinions in Lopez, the school gun case, and Morrison, and the Obamacare case. He says, screw it all, let's go back to the original meaning of commerce. Um, I think he's probably alone in the court in that, in that sentiment. Uh, even Judge Kavanaugh, now Justice Kavanaugh, during his hearing, said that he's an originalist, but has a strong dose of precedent. Um, so uh, there's a long way of saying that uh, uh, these are all important schools of thought. Even Justice Kagan said we're all textualists now. Uh, I give Justice Scalia a lot of the credit for that. Uh, if you read some of the opinions from the 1970s, uh, and you will read a lot of them, they're just all over the place. Like, well, here's what we think the law means, and we don't need to give any reason why. Um, and today, I think there's more of a grounding to how any given case fits in history, but it's not applied in any sort of cohesive fashion. If you're so inclined, I didn't assign it, but after the reading in Brown, we have an expert from Michael McConnell and Michael Klarman. These are two professors, one on the right, one on the left, where they say, can Brown be justified on originalist grounds? 
and we give you the full excerpts. It's a back and forth. It's like a little mini debate, and I leave you for judgment to decide the answer. Um, Chief Justice Warren and Brown said, well, you know, we don't really think the framers wanted to have desegregation in the 1860s, so that's not helpful. Just ignore it. Um, that was perhaps the research understood in the 1960s, but there's been a lot of research done since then. And I think there's actually a fairly credible case that Brown can be an originalist decision. Um, you know, I think it can be. You know, whether it is or not, we can argue, but I think there's pretty solid evidence that uh, under an originalist approach, these school segregation cases were correctly decided. But, you know, I'll leave that to your judgment to decide. It's, 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 it's a very rampant debate, and even law professors don't agree, which is why we'd like to give you both sides of the debate and, and make your own decision. So you, so you said it was originalism, <coughs> understanding the text. Originalism, textualism, textualism generally, <coughs> right. At that time. Yeah, so textualism usually refers to a statute, right? And statutes can be updated fairly easily. A constitution can't, and a constitution's pretty damn old. So it's a specific skill set of understanding meanings of a constitution drafted 200 years ago versus a statute drafted five minutes ago, right? Usually textualism refers to interpreting statutes and the originalism is for interpreting a constitution, but these are not hard and fast rules. Um, is legislation even offered here? Is that a class that's offered? Is that on the schedule, legislation? Oh, God, you guys are less. It's a good class. This is what you learn in legislation. I'll teach this probably a little bit more in First Amendment as well, if you can find a way to take the course. Um, but these are, these are schools of constitutional thought. Um, just for full disclosure, I'm an originalist. I, I'm a card-carrying member, if there's such a card. Uh, Randy Barnett, the co-author, he was the most prominent originalist in the country. Um, but we try not to make our book as hitting over the head with it. And the things we do, I don't really try to hit in class. I, I try to give as many opinions as I can. What? I just, I don't know how you can be an originalist in the 21st century. Oh, That's man. Like, okay. Well, I, but I, this is my problem when I was reading it. Like, like, I don't, what else can I ask? Is, is wouldn't falling versus sharp, like, weren't they kind of bound by, like, all of the... Guys, you guys, just, just, just one at a time, one at a time, one at a time, please. I'm so yeah. sorry. I did interrupt you. I'm so sorry. Please finish. Yeah. It just, just, just one at a time. I try to keep, okay. And, maybe you want to add something? Yeah. No, I apologize, by the way. I did not really know. I was just going to ask, on Falling versus Sharp, they did all of these, like, acrobatics to get to the mm. right result because of the prior precedent that had constrained other reasonable avenues that they could have decided this case on. Um, is, is the reason for doing that because they don't want to disrupt, like, the stability of the whatever it is because I just I don't know like this it seemed like they could have really easily decided this if they turned around and said like those prior precedents there are a lot of them now we're just wrong okay so let me try to answer Elia's question yours <clears throat> in one fell swoop right so I, I I just I'll infer from your question that how can you be an originalist because the results we reach are things you don't like what, what what's the what's the base of your 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 your, your well, skepticism And? So, to... What's your time, guys? Let her talk. Let her talk. <clears throat> well, just, I was just thinking that. Like, but but can't... What's, what's the problem, though, that we have cell phones? What, what's, what's, the, what's the problem? Well, when I was reading the case, they did say that. Like, what, what, when they were trying to say, you know, the, the points on how mm -hmm. to interpret the law, and they were wanting to go back to how the founding fathers were originally intending when they wrote the law, but the times are so different. So you think the Constitution's out of date? Not, not so much out of date, but not so much to comprehend, not to evaluate at that time so much what they were meaning when they... So, okay, let me, I think I, think I get your point. If I, if I don't, please correct me. Um, so we have the oldest written Constitution in the world over 220 something years old. I can't do math that quickly, but it's been 220 something years, right? Um, most nations have fairly recent constitutions, made them drafted after World War II. And I'll admit, our constitution is pretty outdated, right? If you look at some constitutions around the world, they have some really good stuff in there. Various provisions, right? For example, the South African constitution is a good one. If you want to read that one, that's a fairly modern one. Take a look at that one one day. Um, now, how can be an originalist? Well, we have a way of amending the constitution had very few amendments, 27 amendments in 200 years. Now, 
perhaps that's a failing of our constitution. Maybe, maybe it is, right? Maybe we need to just start from scratch and just make new constitution altogether. Fine. But until we start from scratch, we're stuck with it. And to the extent we have her in constitution that's 200 years old, I think there are good ways and not so good ways of interpreting it. And in terms of what I think the better way is, is one of seeing what did the document mean when it was drafted. Now, let me bring this to Brown a little bit. I think it was going towards Mia's question as well in bowling. You said, I'm paraphrasing, reaching the right result. What does that mean, reaching the right result? I don't think that anybody is going to argue in this class that what, what was being disputed here, the circumstances were wrong. Like how they were being treated was not equal. So, right. So it's a matter, it's immoral, it's unjust. Okay. There's a war fought for this reason and amendments written mm -hmm. to prevent exactly this from happening. Okay, so we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll agree with that, right? That there's a moral and just cause here. What if the law reads to an unjust result? Then the law should be amended. The, question, the question was, what happens if we have a law, whether it's a statute or a constitution, whatever it happens to be, and it fairly leads to an unjust result? In a normal situation, the law should be amended. But in this situation, you have um, an entire structure that is reinforcing mm -hmm. injustice. And did the Brown decision destroy that structure? Mm -hmm. It chipped away. Mm -hmm. So this is a point I was going to come to later with the Cooper, but I'll, I'll jump into it now. Um, Law students come to law school and they see the courts as like, you know, this place that's going to save them and to make just in my, maybe you're wiser than most law students. It's not. It's not going to. And no matter what you write in a Supreme Court decision, unless there is um, buy-in, acceptance from a, enough of a people, it's just paper. So when you say the, the right result, I'm with you, right? I, I get it. But until there's the political will among a sizable percentage of the population to make some sort of change, reading the Constitution in one fashion or another won't make a lick of a difference. So that's why perhaps I'm not as troubled, right? If I think the Constitution's interpreted in, in an antiquated fashion and maybe reach results you don't like, um, then change the law, amend the Constitution. Now, we'll get to this with Cooper v. Aaron in a bit. But what let those kids into that school was not a court decision, but federal paratroopers. It was federal paratroopers, right? The president sent in troops, and, and that's where they got into school. Um, it did, it, yeah, it didn't matter what a district judge said. It didn't matter what Justice Warren said. The paratroopers it, wouldn't have enforced the decision if the decision hadn't been there. Well, that's true. That's true. That's true. But the point I'm trying to make is a court decision only goes so far, right? It was valuable to have it. I'm not trying to diminish the fact that there was a court decision. But the point I can leave, and this sort of addresses the question, is just because a constitution doesn't reach the result you like doesn't mean the correct answer is to perhaps ignore what the provision. Now, with the desegregation cases, I do think they reached, I think, the correct result, perhaps for different reasons. I can get the bowling to be sharp in a minute. But don't think that just because the text of the Constitution leads to results that are improper, that the correct remedy is to just ignore the text and move to somewhere else. Right? It, it's a very easy thing to say as well, what should matter is the result, what might be called happy endings. Right? As long as you reach a happy ending, the ends are justifying the means. We'll do, we'll do opinions this semester where the result is perhaps very justifiable as an ethical matter. But there's not much law there, right? There's not much law there the basis on which that ruling is being issued. And one thing I try to do when I teach this class and maybe succeed or fail is try very hard, not always possible, to separate what you think the correct result ought to be, and where the law 
should go. And those are not always going to be in the same direction. So I think we can all agree that school segregation is an evil. And I think it's violative of the 14th Amendment. So this is one case in which the text and I think the moral result are in the same line. Uh, but we'll do some other cases this semester where you might not see those two in the same parallel, where the moral and just result just doesn't fit within the text of the Constitution. And at that point, you ask yourself, what's the remedy? Should a judge say, we think this is correct because it's 2018? Or should a judge say, it's not for us to decide, let the democratic process take care of it? And then what happens if the democratic process doesn't take care of it, and then you have this ongoing inequity? These are not simple questions by any stretch of the imagination. But the courts aren't the answer. And I think today we should realize that very clearly for a lot of people, the courts aren't going to be the answer. Yeah? So, and then kind of going back to your initial purpose, purpose, purposism mm -hmm. and textualism and originalism. Mm -hmm. So, if so, if you're so, if the, as a as an originalist, if you're um, interpreting the text based on the meaning as understood at the time that it was written around, mm -hmm. how would you? So that's based on circumstance. I mean, circumstances at that time. So how is that different from uh, the purpose? The purpose. <laughs> the intent of the framers. Ah. I mean, isn't it kind of circling right back? Are you going right back there? So let me give you an example, right? The... So, so there are, you know, 400 members of Con 435 members of Congress, right? Lots of members. When we're trying to find an intent, whose intent do we pick? How do we attribute one person voted for one reason, another person voted for a third reason, and they vote for maybe they didn't know why they just voted because they were lazy, they didn't really care. That's a, that's a valid point. But then how do you pick which? So, which so the, and let me give you a little bit of history. Um, I'm going to go way off topic, but I, 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 will, I, I do want to answer your question. Um, <clears throat> originalism evolved throughout the years, and this is an ongoing dispute, so I'll try and keep this as straight as I can. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, you would often hear the phrase, what was the framer's intent? You probably have heard that. What was the original intent? And there was a problem with original intent that I just gave to Janice, right? If you have Madison thinking one thing and Hamilton thinking another and then Jefferson thinking a third, whose intent do you pick, right? People didn't agree today. They don't agree 300 years ago. So there was a move within originalism from framers' intent to what you might call original public meaning, which is what Justice Scalia advocated for. He wasn't the only one, but he was the most famous, saying, well, we can try and find the meaning of words through historical sources, dictionaries, and the like. And there are various ways of doing it. Now, this is not foolproof. And there's a lot of failings with originalism. And I don't even want to go too far into it today. Um, but when you have uh, a focus on original public meaning, you eliminate the problem of disaggregating various intents. And that's mostly where you have originalism today. But there are different kinds of originalism, right? Uh, another type of originalism might be called original expectations, right? If the framers had knew about cell phones, how would they have expected the Fourth Amendment to apply to cell phones? Right? That's one school of thought. Um, another is original methods, right? If the framers were given a legal problem, what methods would they have used to understand the meaning? So even within originals, there are different camps. And I don't want to even pretend to give you a thorough uh, summary of them today. But there's a fairly wide variety of approaches to originalism. Yeah. So then on, um, on Bob, um, in an originalist, like, what would be the reason to not apply an originalist thought if you're going to say, like, okay, at the time that, you know, obviously everybody privileges or immunities has been really messed up, um, how easy would it be to decide a case on privileges or immunities in a situation? Um, but instead of, like, going with the originalist and, and fixing all that precedent, you find a, like, lateral angle to get to the right result, is, is that because of like you need the stability in the law? Or what are the reasons for, for not fixing in that situation? Well, I mean, use that phrase again, the right result, right? And, and just, just I, I want to just, just pause on that for a minute. What, when you say, by that just, yeah, I, just, just one second, I'll to condition a minute. Um, when you say right result, that presumes that when a judge looks at a case, whatever the case happens to be, 
he starts with what the result should be and works backwards. Right? In other words, it didn't really matter what arguments were presented. You know, that argument, that briefing, none of that actually mattered. They had a result they wanted to reach, and then they worked backwards. I, you know, personally, I'm not a fan of that approach of judging. I think arguments should matter. I think briefs should matter. I think people, what they say, should matter. Um, but if you take the result that judge is just trying to reach a certain end, then what is the process, right? What, what's the point of writing all these briefs, which you guys are as lawyers, if the judge already made up his mind? Um, that, that strikes me as problematic. Now, we can all say that all judges do this anyway, whether they admit it or not. Maybe that's true. I don't know. But it, it strikes me as really problematic if a judge has the result in mind and just sort of works his way there. Um, now, why would a judge not be originalist? Well, maybe it doesn't reach results he wants to get. Or there's still valid criticisms, of, there are valid criticisms of originalism, that it's indeterminate, that you can't find original meaning, that it just leads to conservative results because of an old document. I mean, there are criticisms of it. But the, the, the basic premise that a judge should simply pick the just result and work there, um, maybe judges do it all the time. I, I have a difficulty with that. So the, the, school that, uh, the school of thought that Kanishas gave is what's often called critical legal studies. Do you hear the phrase? <coughs> yeah, so the idea is it's all just a charade. It doesn't matter. All judges are merely trying to get the result they want to get to. So it's just cut the crap and drop the doctrine. Is that summary? I mean, it's like, come on, just, just move on. And the stop. if you're going to decide on the facts, decide on the facts. If you're going to decide, you already know what you're going to, what your answer will be before you get through so then, so so then, what's the point of courts if it's just they made their decision? Why even have the arguments? Why have briefs? I. Now, what if I were to tell you that in some cases, some judges are feel constrained by originalism? Would you believe it? Well, so then yeah, let me, I'm, I'm not going to try and persuade you. I don't think I will. But I, <laughs> I don't think I, no, I don't think I will. And I, I mean that. I, I don't, I actually, I don't care about persuading you. And I mean that sincerely. I want to present you different alternate ideas and make your adults, you can make your own judgment. I do mean that sincerely. But. There are judges, and I do think they exist, who believe that sometimes the Constitution leads them in directions that they don't want to go. And I'll give you an example that um, may come back up. So some years ago, Congress enacted a partial birth abortion ban. Right? It was a ban on partial birth abortion, which is a, a late-term abortion process. Now, Justice Thomas, as you probably know, wants to overturn Roe v. Wade. He said it several times. So did Justice Scalia. But it was a federal abortion ban and not a state abortion ban. So you should be thinking, wait a minute, which enumerated power gives Congress the ability to regulate abortions? And Justice Thomas wrote an opinion saying, you know, I have questions if a federal abortion ban can be justified under the commerce and necessary and proper power. But no one raised that argument. So I expect in the future, and this is a test for you, can you should pay attention, that if there's future challenges to various federal abortion laws, We'll see what Thomas does. We'll see, you know what? Thomas does whatever Scalia says. Well, Scalia's yeah, dead. Scalia, exactly. Actually, it's not true. No, now I'm going to disagree with you. 
That's a myth. <laughs> it's not true. Now, now I'm going to say it's not true. No, 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 no. In fact, shh, please just look at me. In fact, Joseph Thomas made a speech a few months ago where he said, Scalia followed me in a number of cases. I believe that. Uh, I, now I'll say you're wrong. No, this, this is a common trope. It's not true. But, but there are, I think, methodologies that constrain judges. And I think originalism is one of them. Whether it works or not, take, pay attention. That if a, federal, if a judge says that this uh, is a federal law, can't be sustained in the commerce power, even though he wants to overturn abortion altogether, I think it'd be significant. Just pay attention. I'm telling you, it, it's not perfect. I don't think any judge sticks 100%. <laughs> Deal. Yes. Okay, I think I'm just, um, I'm, I, I don't think I have a clear understanding, not that it's necessarily relevant for today's reading, but um, of originalism in the sense, I'm looking on Wikipedia. Olive. <laughs> Olive. <laughs> and it, it says uh, pretty much what you said, they believe in interpreting the Constitution um, from the time of the enactment. and agree to adhere to it only being changed by steps set out in Article 5. My problem with that is I want to know from an originalist point of view, what, what do you think about things like slavery? What do you think about things about equality? Because I'm certain that some of the founding fathers had slaves. And so that's my problem. How can you be, how can you have allegiance to a document that is so holy and just for, for many, many people? Um, I have a problem with that, so I need clarification on what exactly that means. So we had two foundings. Guys, guys, just want to serve. Okay, you, okay. Oh, cool. Yep. That's okay. All I have to say. We had, we had two foundings, right? You had a founding in 1787, another one in the 1860s. So it's not only the framers in the 1780s; it was also the people who ratified the 13th Amendment, which eradicated slavery, and the 14th Amendment, which I think did a lot of stuff that wasn't actually done, and the 15th, which eradicated uh, uh, race segregation for voting. So it wasn't a perfect document at the beginning, and it's been amended a number of times in very profound ways. Uh, suffrage was given to women with the 19th Amendment. Uh, there have been improvements. It's perhaps not perfect yet, um, but I think the response to that is it's based on the document we have now, and we have an amended document that addresses slavery, addresses some of that inequity. And I think we've studied in this class that the way the court interpreted the 13th and 14th Amendments in the civil rights cases, in Crookshank, probably wasn't correct. And had the document given, I think, its full effect, um, I think the course for history would have been quite different as a nation. Maybe, I don't know. I, I saw a hand somewhere here. Yeah, yeah. So your point is that original does not mean the original constitution. Not just 1787. Yes, ma'am. When the 18th, sorry, 19th Amendment, when the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868, that's your time frame, right? The original Constitution didn't put any limits on states. That wasn't there. It was in the 1860s, after a bloody civil war, they made that change. So you have to read the document as it exists today, right? The Section 1 repealed the 355th Clause, right? Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. Knocked it out. It's in the Constitution, but it's been effectively repealed. So there's still things that are failing, right? And I'll give you another example. We'll do um, gender equality cases in that week or two. I can't remember what it was in the syllabus, but sex discrimination cases, right? How many of you heard of the Equal Rights Amendment, ERA? A couple of you. Not most of you, right? It's not in the Constitution. But in the 1970s, there was an amendment that would have basically said, no discrimination against women. I'm paraphrasing, but that's, that's the gist of it. It didn't get the right number of states. Um, why did it not get the right number of states? Huge debate, books were written on this point. But what the Supreme Court started doing at that time was basically acting as if it already existed. They basically pretended, well, we never amended the Constitution, but we'll give women uh, certain types of protection with respect to discrimination. So in many regards, the court has, I don't use this word, but updated the Constitution in perhaps ways that's not consistent with the original meaning. And you might like that. I would prefer an amendment. I think an amendment's more legitimate. It's by the people. Uh, but if they don't get it, the court does it on its own. And when the court does it on its own, that reduces the impetus to actually amend the Constitution. You don't need an amendment to say that women are equal. <laughs> I don't think you do either. In fact, the 14th Amendment says persons. But if you look at a case like Bradwell, right, they didn't. A lot of the failings, and I'll make this point very bluntly, 
a lot of the failing is the chord itself by not giving the text its full impact, right? It says person, it doesn't say man, it says person. If you actually give the 14th Amendment its original meaning, it's a fairly broad document, which was narrowed in case after case by the court, which I think I gave this to Monico a minute ago. Had the court interpreted the 14th Amendment, I think, in a different fashion in the 1800s, it could have substantially changed the direction of our nation. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to pull out one case here or there. But the text is a hell of a lot broader than perhaps the people who intended even had in mind. <laughs> Oh, you come back to it. Yeah, good. It's like that, what you're saying when the courts essentially saying, well, we don't have an amendment, but you know, we quote unquote updated it unofficially. That's kind of the same thing. Like, it's like the same thing. That phrase that they actually make an overall Yeah, good good point. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. I mean it's it's you know, Bradwell, for example, is never actually overruled. Um, I don't think it was overruled, but go check for the yellow flag or red flag on Westlaw, I don't think it's ever been overruled. Um, but it's sure not good law anymore. What else? Who else? No, well, thanks for asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, thank you, though. Yeah, 30 minutes later. Yeah. Well, so this, this is actually it's kind of similar to, to uh, Mia's question, but <clears throat> aside from the fact that originalism, you know, one of the arguments against it is that it can't be you can't find original meaning easily and that it might be indeterminable. What are some, are those the major arguments against it? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, so, so I'll be self-critical. Um, there are a couple major arguments against originalism, one of which is that you can't find original meaning. Indeed, the framers didn't often agree on things. Go look at the Bank of the United States. Madison and Jefferson said one thing and Hamilton went the other way and you know, how do we even, ha I think that was, a, that was in your midterm maybe. Uh, uh, wasn't it the bank? I think it was, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, there you go. I, I did trick you with that. I did. I did. Um, I'm bad. Um, but one thing is you can't find the original meaning. It's indeterminate. Um, another, another fear is that it's merely just uh, uh, a, a, a shield for reaching conservative results, uh, which is a fairly common criticism. Um, another one is that it doesn't pay enough respect for precedent, that if you have a long-standing precedent that's not consistent with original meaning, do you overturn that precedent? This is Justice Thomas's, uh, 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 you know, sort of over and over again, we need to revisit this case, revisit that case. Um, I can give an entire class on this. I don't want to because I have other things I want to teach today. But there, there are a lot of criticisms for originalism. Should I hand up? What is like that to Dennis's point about the great couple Well, that's. Janice whispered something. You want to say it out loud? No. No, she doesn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I see. So, I mean, your discussion is about original intent, which is a mode that we don't adhere to anymore. You can't find the intent, which is why you try to find meaning, or which. Well, oh, okay, it's different. But the word commerce, for example, I think had a meaning. You refer to interchange, intercourse, right? It didn't mean everything in the world. Commerce had a meaning. That's not what it is today. Um, necessary and proper, I think, had a meaning. I think that searches and seizures had a meaning. Uh, uh, you can look to what various terms meant. Uh, the taxing power, right? There, there, there are provisions where you can understand original meaning. Privileges and immunities, I think, had a meaning, how it's understood. Um, not everything, but I think a lot of provisions you can use original meaning to guide you to a result that might not be consistent with modern precedent. May I just say just one last thing? Please. I think the issue comes in, I think probably what you're hearing a lot of is that you're right. So those words have meaning. And like what Mia said, you don't need to know, you don't need an amendment to say that women are equal. That you know a, a person includes men and women. The problem is, regardless of what school of thought that you're coming from, 
um, is kind of basically what Kanisha alluded to in the very beginning is that it's the um, court itself that takes, regar regardless of what school of thought, they're going to take their what they're trying to accomplish, and they're going to use whatever it is is necessary, uh, like in Dred Scott, throw everything on, uh, um, except the kitchen sink to make the point of what it is you're trying to accomplish in the end. And I, I think that's what that's where the so the schools of thought are thrown out. The, you can throw the schools of thought out the window if they're going to change constantly with different decisions just to make a certain end result happen. And that's what happened in Dred Scott. That's what happened in Bradwell because she is a woman. She wanted to be a lawyer. She is a woman. So uh, she is a person. So, but men think men were thinking that you know, well, uh, you know, she's a wife, and um, you know, God has divined women to have the babies and nurture the babies. <laughs> so therefore, they cannot you know be thinkers and negotiators. And that's a man, that's a man's thought. That's not. <laughs> Well, it's not an, uh, an intent. That's mm -hmm. not textualism. That's not originalism. You, there's no. They took all, you throw all, uh, throw all that away, and that's a man's thought about what women are. So, if you're a man who is on the court, plus eight other men who think that all black people are not human beings, you're gonna find everything but the kitchen sink to make your point because you can't think of men and women. I mean, uh, women and black people as human beings like you. And that's the, it's going to keep, it's the, the problem keeps happening. I think that's, none of it has any original, no offense, it has no credibility. So then what, 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 well, I'm sorry. Then you create a test to make the means fit the ends and justify. So, so then, so then, so then what's the point of courts then? I think the point. Ah, I think the point. One time, one time, just, just in the back, well, yeah. Well, I'm just saying there's, there's a purpose for courts, so mm -hmm. you have, Men who are sitting on the bench and making laws that affect women and people of color, you're dealing with it. Like you're defeating the purpose of what's happening. Here and every day. Catch one time, one time, please. Let her talk. Mm. I just think originalism is like it's like it's just rhetoric. But is it? Catch just one time, please. Yeah. It's not really. It's just a way to justify racism. Prejudice and sexism and all these things—it's not. I don't know. It's, I just think it's just fake. Okay. What she says is fake news. Fake news. Is that original or is that my? This is why I don't talk my own opinions in class. But uh, I will. I will. I'll leave it here. I appreciate all of your thoughts. You all give very. I think. <laughs> You knew she's going to come back to that. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Anyone else? Want to, anyone else make a question or a point? I I do. I sincerely appreciate all of your positions. If I don't agree with them, uh, I learn a lot from all of you every day, and it's actually quite beneficial. Uh, I will take this and go back and think about it later. I grateful for your thoughts. Are you going to blog about it? <laughs> <laughs> Let me know if you blog about it. I'll tell you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, what else? Who do you think Warren was? Chief Justice Warren? Yeah, in this one, in this specific Oh, case. I think Chief Justice Warren was a very good politician. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I think he wrote a very um, specific type of opinion that garnered nine votes. And the opinion was resting on very specific, narrow grounds. And it was an opinion that, even at the time, people criticizing, what the hell is this? I did. And it was an opinion at the time where people said, how are we supposed to start a revolution with this sort of opinion on social science? And it was an opinion that, frankly, most people ignored who were in favor of segregation. Um, and frankly, it was an opinion that didn't get any results for quite some time. And even in the decades later, um, even after Cooper v. Aaron, they just shut the damn school down. Uh, rather than integrate. Yeah, uh, oh, well, su surprise, surprise, but uh, all right, I'll do Cooper now because okay. you want to. Are the judges one, typically one mindset, like they're an originalist or a textualist? No, 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 no. And I made so, this point at the outset. So Very few judges ever adhere to any school of thought. Judges tend to be. Pick and choose. Yeah, buffet. Which is what but let me, okay, let me try to bring, we're now 45 minutes. Let me try to bring this back into somewhat. <laughs>
No, this is valuable. Let me try and bring it back into uh, the readings for today, which was which a very good discussion. Thanks, Noah. <laughs> <laughs> so I can, at this point, I think I can summarize where I basically already talked about it, right? Um, <clears throat> the case arose from school districts in uh, Virginia, um, Delaware, uh, South Carolina, and, oh crap, that's the fourth one. Um, Virginia, Delaware, South Carolina, and, oh, Oklahoma. Oklahoma, of course, if you're around. To be, it's our Kansas, 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 I'm sorry, Kansas. So the case arose from those four school districts, right? But at that point, you had segregation in, uh, I think, almost 30-something states. I don't know the exact number. Um, a lot of states didn't have it as mandatory. Some states actually said that it was permissible, and then local jurisdictions could opt into it. So the exact count is actually hard. Uh, but it was roughly 30-something states. And it wasn't just in the South. You had Delaware, Maryland, you know, Midwest, I'm sorry, uh, Mid-Atlantic states have all had it. Um, the court had originally argued the case while Chief Justice Vinson was in office. Vinson, you probably don't even remember, but he wrote a dissent in Youngstown. He was one of the dissenters in Youngstown. He was a Truman appointee. And he suddenly died of a heart attack. And then President Eisenhower appointed um, Chief Justice Warren to the court. Now, Earl Warren had been the governor of California, a very skilled politician. And one of his less noble moments is he actually was in charge of California during the Korematsu situation. He lived to regret that. Um, and he basically presided over a lot of the internment going on there. Uh, when Warren got in the court, they had the Brown case re-argued. And Warren made it a um, mission of his to get a unanimous opinion. Initially, in Brown, there were going to be maybe a couple dissents. Right? Even in 1952, 53, people were perhaps going to dissent from the opinion. Um, Warren was able to cajole and twist enough arms, and there's, there's a literature on this, or books this high about the Browns case. You can go read about them. Uh, Michael Klarman, who I mentioned earlier, has a really good book about the entire saga, so just pull up his book about the Civil Rights Revolution. Um, and Warren was able to get a majority opinion. Uh, the majority opinion was fairly short, uh, probably not as long as you were expecting. And we didn't edit much. It's basically the entire case is in there. You can read the entire case if you want. There's not much more. We just cut very little out for the edit for the book. Um, what was the basis of the ruling? Well, the first myth is that it overruled Plessy, and I, I don't think it did. Um, it was limited to the context of public education. And it said, in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. That's about as far as it went. So trains, still fine to segregate, um, you know, restaurants, lunch counters, buses, whatever else you want, didn't touch that. And the basis on which they ruled that segregation has no place in public education was based on footnote 11, which was a very controversial thing at the time, which was basically a slew of studies by social scientists that suggested that having segregation reinforces um, ideas of racial inferiority among both black and white students, that black students feel inferior and that white students feel superior. Right? And because of these impacts on public education, the court found that it's not consistent with equal protection of the law to go there. And that's not permissible. Okay? Now, we sort of alluded to this, but the court said that in the 1860s, we had segregated schools in D.C., which we think mentioned before. So if the very Congress that proposed the 14th Amendment was okay with segregated schools, then history is not helpful to us. And we can't turn back the clock to the 1860s. We couldn't turn back the clock to the 1890s with Plessy. So we'll simply move forward from this. Now, if you're really interested in this topic, and I can sense some of you are, I know you have lots of free time, read, yeah, right? Read the chapter that comes after this on the, the mcconnell clarman debate. Just, just read it. You don't have to tell me about it. It's, a, you know, it's, it's long, but just read it. We edited it down pretty good. 
And even if you end up thinking that it's still wrong, I think you'll get a much better understanding of what the historical argument is in favor of Brown and originalism. Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to persuade you. I mean, it may never persuade you. It doesn't really matter to me. But educate yourself and read the debate between McConnell and Klarman. And come back to me. You can talk in office hours. I can't do much more in class than this. But maybe I should sign it next year. I don't know. It's, it's a long reading. But maybe I should. What do you think? You said no? Next year's fine. <laughs> Screw them, right? I'm not, I'm, not ruining, I'm not ruining your weekend. I'm ruining someone else's weekend, right? You know, but maybe I'll, maybe I'll sign next year. I don't know. Randy assigns it, and I never did because no one ever took much interest, but maybe I should. I don't know. Oh, okay. So that's, that's Brown 1. Are there actually any questions about the legal decision in Brown 1? We can talk about the, the implications of it, but the actual, the, the legal reasoning, I tried to summarize as best as I could because we're short on time. But any questions on the actual Brown decision, Brown 1? Yeah. Okay, whatever you want. Justice O'Connor, Justice Ginsburg. Right. She, the case that she did that was in here. We didn't cover that yet, did we? You talking about Frontiero? I possibly read it, but yeah, so Frontiero. So in that, in the beginning of that, it talked about how she strategically mm. her strategy. So I thought about that. Yeah. This right, and yeah. I wonder if it was a strategy to like the whole inferior and norm and that type of thing to like pull on the strings of. The judges like was a play thing. Oh, I did, yeah. And and this this is actually Thurgood Marshall's um, uh, genius. He was the uh, director of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And one second, I'll just take a break. I promise. They recognized that they weren't going to get rid of Plessy in one day, and they developed a fairly rigorous strategy over the course of not years but decades. This was a long strategy where they try to chip away at these various precedents. So um, one of the cases, for example, actually involved Texas, Sweat v. Painter, which I think is referenced in your reading. And that was the UT Austin Law School didn't admit African-American students. And Texas said, OK, fine. We will make a second law school, what's now Thurgood Marshall Law School, TSU, right down the block, right on the other side of the highway. And they said, well, we'll give you a separate school. And in Sweat v. Painter, the court Simply said, well, that's not equal accommodation. It's not equal, even if it's separate. So they said, that's not good. You have to admit black students to the UT Austin Law School. But they deliberately chose elementary school as the target because I think there's sympathy. And I often show this picture. These kids are cute. They're, so cute. <laughs> They're adorable. And they deliberately pick these kids in a fashion that it's saying, well, that can't be that bad, letting this kid into my school. Now, whether people agreed or not, probably not. But there was a deliberate strategy. I think Kanisha said to hug on heartstrings. They look. You really gonna rule against these little kids? Well, and then the whole, oh, we feel sorry for you. And, and so I just felt like the whole thing was kind of so beautifully set up. It was, yeah. With, um, you know, oh, you're making them feel bad about themselves and all that. <coughs> like everybody, I, I have no self-esteem. Everybody doesn't have no self-esteem. But I thought it was really cool the way they um, that play on it and it reminded me of when she. Well, Justice, that Ruth Bader Ginsburg stole her strategy from the NACP. I mean, she borrowed the strategy. Yeah, but she, she, she mirrored her strategy in the Thurgood Marshall approach. That's, that's exactly what she did. And we'll do this when we do the gender equality cases. I, I think Brooke was patiently waiting. Thank you. Um, so when I read the case, um, or the decision, it, you know, it was good. And so, but the thing that frustrated me about it was when, um, Chief Justice Warren mentioned that, um, the end. he said that, um, therefore we hold the plaintiffs and others similarly situated for whom the actions have been brought are by reason of the segregation complained of deprived of equal protection. He went on to say that this decision makes unnecessary any discussion about um, the due process clause. Mm. And so I was like, that was a missed opportunity. You know, if he didn't even want to address it, he just shouldn't have. Otherwise, to say that it wasn't necessary. Yeah, to let, me, let me bridge this to Bowling v. Sharp in a minute, because I think that's, that's relevant. But does anyone else, uh, what's your hand up, Chance? I, I, I'll, I'll come back to you, Prowse, I promise. Okay. You had a question there, Chance? My only question was when you asked <coughs> um, if you have any questions about the case, I didn't understand what was the delay in the implementation. Of it. I, I, I you mean why there was a brown too? Right, like uh, 
why was the, the court so hesitant to implement what they they're saying that the Constitution requires? Okay. Um, here's another cute picture. Uh, I. These pictures are expensive. I put some of these in your book and others not, but you have to pay a lot of money for these pictures. It, it actually, the royalties are crazy. We put a couple of these pictures in your book, but they're, they're very cute. Um, let me do Brooke's question yeah. first, and then I'm going to come to your question, and I'm going to segue to Bowling against Sharp. So again, even in the 1950s, Congress had uh, maintained segregation in the federal schools in the District of Columbia. So you had uh, 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 was this Spotsworth, I think it was Spotsworth, yeah. I have a picture of him. Uh, where is it? Uh, oh yeah, there he is. So that that that's um, yeah, it's Spotsworth Bowling. That's got it right. Spotsworth Bowling, and they challenged that. Now there's a textual problem for the court here, right? The Fourteenth Amendment has an equal protection clause. Fifth Amendment, which applies to Congress, does not have an equal protection clause. So the court does something funky, right? And this is this is sort of where they give up the jig so to speak, right? They say, well, and I can never even get it right, but we say, well, there's an element of liberty that incorporates a concept of equal protection. So therefore, it would be insane to have applied a different standard to Congress than you applied to the states, and we're going to treat them on the same level. Therefore, we reverse incorporate. We say that the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause, ratified in 1868, extends back in time the Fifth Amendment ratified in 91. Now, that opinion leaves a lot of people saying, what the hell is this, right? Well, that, 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 that doesn't make any sense. Now, I'll give you an alternate angle. I think Brooke said missed opportunity. They like the way you, you phrased that. Um, there's a pretty good argument that Brown can be decided solely on due process of law. Um, that equal protection discusses protecting people. It's not really the best fit that when you have a law, you ask, what's the rational basis for this law? And if the answer is white, super white supremacy, you say, that's not a rational basis. I think Brown's a much easier case than social science and equal protection. I think just laws, and you see this in Loving about a decade later, that if a law is premised on white supremacy, then it's not a rational law. That's easier in my mind, I, and that, which is why, to be an originalist, it's actually a fairly easy case. That all this, stuff about social science, I think, just sort of gets you on the wrong path because, well, you, you know, there might be reasons why you have to integrate schools. What does that say about a, a, of a train car or a bus? You don't have, you know, same sort of social pressures on a train that you have in a public school. But Brooke's point, I think, is very well taken, right? Due process is actually a much better way. One last point, privileges or immunities. Um, there's a pretty good argument that citizenship education was a privilege or immunity of citizenship. A pretty good argument. And if you read the McConnell piece that comes in your reading afterwards, he makes his point that one of the privileges given to the freedmen was education. So th there are some pretty good originalist, God save me, right, originalist <laughs> arguments about why school segregation is unconstitutional. <laughs> they're real, they're not fake, right? But <laughs> there are some arguments, they're not foolproof, but the court didn't take them. They simply said, well, we don't see an argument based on history, so we're just going to chuck it aside and go down this other route. So, you know, you can criticize Brown. In fact, if you really want, um, if you really want, there's a book called What Brown Should Have Said. What Brown Should Have Said. And a bunch of law professors tried to actually write opinions of how Brown should have went, like a concurring opinion, right? That they were alive in 1953, what would they have written for the Brown case? And I'll tell you, they're a hell of a lot better than what you have in your book. They're based on privileges or immunities. Some of them are based on due process. They don't go to footnote 11, social science stuff. They actually have arguments about the framers of the 14th Amendment, Civil Rights Act of 75, right? So you can, here's what I'm saying, is you can like the result in a case and still say the reasoning is not very good and that's fine, you can do that. And if you're interested, there's a book called What Roe Should Have Said, where they actually rewrite the Roe v. Wade decision, which I think will have a lot more persuasion than what you're going to read in a few weeks. And there's a new book coming out called What Obergefell Should Have Said, which is the gay marriage decision. And I think those opinions are a hell of a lot more persuasive than what the court did. So 
There are ways of making an opinion that maybe reaches results that are acceptable to you, but are in fact grounded in some sort of methodology. But judges don't always do that stuff. They, they, they're, judges are put on, okay, let me, let me, I'll get to you in a second. Has a person wind up in the Supreme Court? Is it because they're the smartest person in the room? No. Because they knew the president, right? How does a person wind up in the US Supreme Court? Because they knew the president. Yeah, there's an old story. Um, it's, a, it's a story in a state where you know, the, the governor's in his mansion, and there's someone knocking on his door, middle of the night. He's like, what's going on? And he opens the door. It's you know, some commissioner. He's like, the chief justice just died. Please nominate me, right? <laughs> of the state. People get on courts because they are connected to politics. It's not, even Roosevelt's judges, right? Several of them were senators. It was fairly common to be a politician, right? Maybe there were state judges who were politicians before that. Maybe they worked in law firms, right? You do have academics, and you know, they're usually the worst justices. Not, not always, but, but often they are. Not always. Some of them are good. But the people on the court aren't there because of the smartest people in the room. They're there because of a unique blend of political circumstances that led them there. And you know, in this class, we read them as if these are the oracles, that they know the right stuff. And often, they're not the best. They make compromises, right? Look at the Brown decision. They had to make some real arm-twisting decisions to get this to be 9-0. And I don't think Chief Justice Warren much cared what the opinion said as long as he got nine votes on it. I think that reflects the actual opinion that came out. So if you all you know, want to write a majority opinion for desegregation, you can actually make it a little bit more reasoned and some history thrown in there that, that God bless you, right? You can do it. Um, in fact, yeah, take a look. It's, it's probably in the library. What, what Brown shows that very good book published about 10 years ago. Very good book. A lot of really smart people wrote that book, and I think uh, uh, you can approach it. All right. Did I kind of answer your question? Yeah, because I was thinking that the reason that he didn't touch on it was for the political aspect of trying to get everyone to. Yeah. Because um, be due process, keep in mind, this was a couple years for Williamson v. Lee Optical, right? Oh. Due process was not popular back then. Right, due process was Lochner. Right, due process was Lochner. And if you notice, they cite Buchanan against Worley, right? They mentioned Buchanan against Worley. That's the Louisville segregation case. They, 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 they pretend it's an equal protection case. That was a Lochner era case about property rights. So again, maybe one of the reasons, Brooke, to your question, they didn't talk about due process, they don't want to be like Lochner. They're like, okay, we, we, don't, we don't do that stuff anymore. We're no more Lochnerism. By, by the time you get to Loving against Virginia, they sort of chuck that out the window. They go full due process. And we'll get to loving, I promise. We'll, we will finish today. All right. Now, oh, God, I've got your question. What's your question, Janice? Well, I, 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 yeah. I guess this goes right into Cooper. part two. Yeah, yeah, it's so, part two. So the, the trepidation on the Yes, yes, ma'am. Not actually want to implement. Yeah, 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 good. Just moved on. Yeah, I'm okay. a little confusing. Yeah, okay, let me, let me, let me do Janice's question. I'll go brown two to Cooper. Uh, let me show you some pictures first. I got some really good pictures in this one. I don't have all the permissions for these. It's not your book, but I got them. Uh, this is... On my blog, I'm not as strict. But for the book, we have to be really strict because it's not my thing. Uh, so this is actually Monroe Elementary in uh, Topeka, Kansas. Uh, yeah, they're adorable. Those desks look very uncomfortable, though. I, I don't know. Those, desks, those old school desks. I'm sorry? <laughs> what? You know, I hate these chairs. These chairs are awful. I think we all agree. These are awful, not good for learning. They don't bend. They're just really bad. I'm, I'm with you. When we have faculty meetings in here, we all sit there we're like, wow, these desks suck. So we, we actually have to. Uh, this is actually Sumner Elementary. It's a museum. So if you're ever in Topeka, Kansas, you can go visit. It's an, it's, it's an actual uh, museum. I've not been there, but I would like to go at some point to visit. I was at the school in Little Rock, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, OK, so here is a, 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 a Thurgood Marshall his associates after the decision was announced. Uh, here's the various people of the NWSP Legal Defense Fund, their legal team. Um, this is not Linda Brown. I can't tell you any pictures. They say this is Linda Brown. It's not. Her name was Nettie Hunt, um, with her daughter Nikki. But everyone says, "Oh, it's Linda Brown." It's not her. Um, so just just get it right. But I love this caption: the High Court ban segregation. We got the court in the background. It's a really good, really good picture. Um, Segregation, public schools, ended by court. Now, this is for Janice's question, right? Did Brown actually end segregation in public schools? And the answer is not even close. Um, all right, so we'll, so we'll start here. So 
let me answer Janice's question. Right? Why did the court not simply say, OK, we made our ruling. You guys, go open up your doors. Have I not called anyone yet? Oh my goodness, I haven't called a single person yet. I'm an hour in. This is. I know, you don't mind. Um, I'm going to start calling people. I'm sorry. I, I've been talking way too much. I get myself in trouble. Who's next? Where did I, are you next, Brooke? OK. OK, I'm sorry. You're next. You're next. OK. You've been on call since like last week, just waiting. So Brooke, let me ask you this question, right? At the very end of the opinion, they do something weird, which I don't think you've ever seen before, right? Mm -hmm. They say, we are going to restore the case to the calendar, ask for more briefing from the various parties, and argue it again, and then we'll figure stuff out. Did any school have an obligation after Brown wants to do a damn thing? No. No, they didn't. So let me ask you the question Janice posed to me, right? Why? Yeah, thanks, right? Why did the court do this bit with this re-argument? Um, so their, their thought was that the approach to the desegregation would be best handled um, by hearing from the local court. Well, okay, you're right. Why did the court think that this would proceed best if the local trial, district courts handle this? Um, because they would have to be the ones to do the desegregation. Okay, and I think this is an important point, right? Mm -hmm. There were literally hundreds, if not thousands, of school districts. I don't know the number, but it's a lot, that had segregation. I'll just say thousands, make the number even bigger, right? The Supreme Court recognized um, we can't manage this, right? It's logistically impossible for the Supreme Court to put its hand into a thousand school districts. So they made a decision. They said, we're going to delegate this back, this is Brown 2, we're going to remand the cases back to the school districts, the local district courts, and basically come back at us if something's wrong, but we're going to keep our hands off this for the, for the time being. Okay? Now, that was a pragmatic decision I think needed to get to the nine votes. There was no way, no how, the Supreme Court was going to monitor thousands of school districts. Just logistically, it wasn't possible. But more practically, there's an issue, right? The case in Brown only concerned school districts from Kansas, from Delaware, uh, Virginia, and South Carolina, right? Four states. You had 30-odd other states that weren't even part of the case. And I think I asked this question when we did other topics, but <clears throat> could the court even bind states that weren't party to the case, right? Can the Supreme Court just say, we decide the Constitution, or you're all stuck with it? And this is, I think, is a fairly difficult legal question, and the court didn't think they had that power. Maybe they didn't exercise it. We don't know which one, but they didn't exercise that power. Instead, this forced a game of sorts. I don't use the word game lightly, but this required a lot of lawsuits. And throughout the United States, the NACP filed individual lawsuits against each school board in every city, in every state that maintained segregation. It wasn't everyone just said, you know what, Earl Warren said it, let's go follow him. It's, no, we're going to resist. And I have a reading that I gave you on the resistance, the massive resistance, which I think is a, a good primer on this, again, books about this topic. But Brown, too, said, we're going to, you know, see what happens. Send this back down to the um, local courts and let them supervise things. Now, uh, things didn't go, perhaps, according to plan. Now, maybe the Supreme Court knew this was going to be a rough show. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. But it got pretty bad. And after or even before Brown 2 is decided, we'll talk about the situation in Little Rock, Arkansas. Anyone from Arkansas, Little Rock? No, okay. Um, who's there? You're from Little Rock? Dusty's from Arkansas. Oh, who are you pointing to? Okay, Dusty. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> yeah, she actually emailed me and said she was sick and she's watching at home. So hi, Dusty. How you doing? Um, I think she's watching at least. Um, I'll, ch I'll check the comment thread later. Feel better. Feel better. Yeah, thank you. Um, in Little Rock, initially, the school board um, took some voluntary steps for integration. Now, they realized we can't do this immediately for logistical reasons. You have to change bus routes. You maybe have to reallocate staff. You have to hire people. OK. <clears throat> there are probably some legitimate reasons to not do it immediately. You have to have enrollment, registrations. OK, maybe it takes six months, maybe a year, whatever that number is, right? But after Brown, there was this uh, backlash to the decision, where throughout huge quarters of the country, people said this decision was not legitimate should not be accepted. It was not a correct construction of the Constitution. Um, you have a group called the, uh, the Citizens Council that argued that the Supreme Court uh, could not de define the Supreme Law of the land, and they were wrong. And you had uh, uh, the Southern Manifesto, which was signed by a number of prominent politicians. And they argued that, well, the Supreme Court said it, but we don't have to follow it until they tell us to do so. So in other words, let them sue every school district and then keep, keep resisting as long as you can. Drag it out. Um, their approach was, you know, they didn't make that up. This was something that Andrew Jackson argued for, Abraham Lincoln had argued for, that the court's judgments only bind those parties. With Dred Scott, Lincoln said that it involved Scott and Sanford. That's it. And so Southern states said, well, this didn't involve Arkansas or Little Rock, so we have to follow it. So that started what I call a game of whack-a-mole. Do you know what whack-a-mole is? You ever see like the carnival where you have this little hammer and a thing pops up, you pop it, and then you, you, you keep popping, and they keep popping back in, right? And that's how we describe the Cooper against Aaron situation. It's a game of whack-a-mole. So here's what happened. The state adopted a constitutional referendum which said um, schools cannot be integrated. Wait a minute. How can you have a state referendum that is the exact opposite what a Supreme Court decision said. So you have the NAACP who goes to federal court and say, hey, integrate. And then a state court says, no, 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 don't integrate. And that creates a conflict, right? You have a state judge saying, don't integrate. And you're a federal judge saying, integrate. Um, and the school board was put in a very bizarre situation that they didn't want to be in. And basically, the federal court said, ignore the state court. So they tried to integrate. Um, when they had the Little Rock Nine, I got pictures of them right over here. This is a, this, this, there's actually a happy ending for this picture. Um, decades later, this student and this person actually met, and she apologized for that. It's, it's, a, it's a touching video if you want to watch it, but there, there's a happy ending. But I want to put this picture up. They allowed nine of these kids to enroll, high school students, you know, 17, 16 years old, to enroll in this high school in Little Rock. And there were basically mobs <coughs> throwing stuff at them, spitting at them, cursing at them. Uh, it's awful. There's video of this, and you can Google it on YouTube. I have it in my, when the video comes out eventually, it will have some of the clips in there, but it's pretty awful. And the students were basically being mobbed. And at that point, the school said, we can't have this. Kids can't learn. <sighs> it gets worse. The governor of Arkansas, a guy named Orville Faubus, uh, who was, he was an opportunist. He, he did this mostly with political gain. He was actually fairly moderate earlier in his career. But he realized for to get reelected, he had to embrace the segregation. So he went hard on this. And he actually called out the state guard to in his words, keep order at the school and keep these students from enrolling. Um, at that point, a federal judge ordered the governor to stand down, ordered the National Guard to stand down. What happened next is whack-a-mole. The Little Rock Police Department walked in because they were not yet bound by a court decree. And you see how this works, right? The school board was bound, so they complied. Then the governor came in, he got sued. And then they sued up the, uh, the National Guard. And the police department came in, so one after the other after the other. And then finally, President Eisenhower, who, by the way, was no fan of Brown. He, as far as we can tell, didn't agree with the decision. Um, 
he never spoke favorably about it. He actually criticized Earl Warren extensively. But President Eisenhower said, we can't have a situation where federal courts are issuing orders and people are not regarding it. This was a district court, not the SCOTUS, but the district court. And he mobilized 101st Airborne. Now, these were paratroopers who, not even you know, 15 years earlier, had liberated Europe from the Nazis. And now they're being sent to Arkansas. Um, it's a bizarre, it, it is, it's bizarre. Now, they didn't actually parachute in, they came by car, right? You know, you know I, I always thought they would just parachute in, which would be much cooler, but they actually came by truck um, from the other states. So they escorted these kids into school. And on the first day, uh, the principal basically kept them locked in his office because it was so dangerous. He wouldn't even let them into the classrooms. For their own, for their own safety, they just couldn't. Um, if any of you ever go to Little Rock, I went there a couple years ago. It's still an active high school. I felt like the biggest creep. Because uh, I'm taking pictures of like their high school. Uh, <laughs> I felt like such a creep, but you're welcome. I have pictures. It's a beautiful school. It's humongous. And I mean, I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah, class was in session. It was really creepy. I felt weird, but, but you're welcome. You're welcome. But I just want you to get a sense of scale of these steps. And, you know, walking down the street, walking up these steps was pretty powerful. I mean, it, I, I can't imagine what it was like at the time, but it's, you know, there's a real feeling of history there that, that you should all go and check it out if you're ever in Little Rock. It's a, a few blocks from the Capitol Mansion as well. But even then, after Eisenhower sent in the troops, that wasn't sustainable because there was so much chaos outside of people screaming, you can't educate students. So at that point, the school board goes to the federal district court and they ask for an extension. They say, we cannot integrate this building. We can't do it. We need 30 months. We need a two and a half year extension. And in two and a half years, we'll have enough time to make the proper arrangements and maybe hopefully things quiet down. The district court surprised everyone. District court gave him 30 months. Again, this was not the judge on the ground in Little Rock. He was there. And he said, you know what? I don't like this. I agree I have to integrate, but I, we can't have this bedlam, in this chaos, he called it. Chaos and bedlam. So he gave him a 30-month extension. The students then appealed up to the Court of Appeals. And the Court of Appeals said, no, 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 no. You can't do this, right? All deliberate speed. That was a phrase in Brown, too. All deliberate speed. 30 months is not all deliberate speed. Do it now. Next school year, starting in September. This was over the summer in August. That triggered a race to the Supreme Court in a very strange, strange situation. Um, the court had an emergency hearing in August and they had another emergency hearing in September. Um, and the purpose of the court's hearing was to answer a fairly narrow question, right? Should the 30-month extension be granted? That was the actual question presented to the court. And you read Cooper, right? And they resolved that pretty quickly, saying, no, you can't get 30 more, more months. That's not all deliberate speed. Um, and if the opinion were just that, it wasn't, you know, I don't think I'd put it in your case book. But the reason why, and actually, I add, Randy didn't have Cooper against Aaron in his last edition. I made him add it, which I think is an important case to add. Hope you all enjoyed learning from it. But the next part of the opinion is where the court does other stuff. And they say that we have to answer the claim of the governor that he's not bound by our decision in Brown, right? And this is where the court um, is trying to fight against the massive resistance, the whack-a-mole, as I call it, right? They're trying to say, look, you little pieces of crap, right? We, we're not going to let you have to sue every single freaking person in the state till you get a judgment, right? You're going to sue the janitor next, right? Who are you going to sue? You're going to sue the custodians that they can block through with their broomsticks, right? Who are you going to sue next? They're trying to say, we're done with this stuff, right? We're going to make our decision, and that's going to be binding on everyone. Now, I'm going to get to actually the, the case in a minute, but I want to say what happened afterwards. Within hours after Cooper v. Aaron was decided, the Arkansas government basically pulled a trick. What did they do? They leased all the public schools to a private corporation who are not bound by the 14th Amendment. So then a court said, no, 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 you're not doing this. And the court said, we're going to intervene and block the transfer. At that point, what did the school district do? They just shut down. 
altogether. They were not alone. Throughout the country, there were entire regions where there was zero public schooling for years. In that year, 19, was it 58 or 9, no one graduated from high school in Little Rock. There was an entire generation that had no, no diplomas. Just no one graduated from high school that year. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> Poor Dusty, he's not here to defend her honor, right? <laughs> but schools just shut down. But they didn't get Republic education, they did something a little more crafty. They started handing out tax credits to go to a private school that were segregated. So it wasn't that education simply ended, they simply just sh shifted it over to private channels. And this went on for years. Eventually the schools in Little Rock opened up again. Why? As history will retell, uh, the school board had more moderate members elected. That even in Little Rock, people said, okay, this is crazy, right? We can't, uh, we can't keep doing this. This is insane. You know, it's not worth it. And eventually school districts reopened. Now, does that mean the school districts were integrated right away? No. It took a long time, maybe never happened, I don't know. We can argue the, the aftermath, but this was a lengthy process that required the intervention of troops, and then people voted differently, and also the federal government. Uh, in the 1960s, there were various laws passed to states saying, if you want federal money, you have to comply with certain conditions, one of which is you can't discriminate. So there were a lot of political forces that went to actually integrating high schools in Arkansas um, and elsewhere. It wasn't just a function of the court's decision. Now, I want to go back to Janice's question 20 minutes ago, right? Why didn't the court just say, all of you just integrate right now? They probably couldn't see this exactly, Little Rock, but they probably had an idea of what would happen. And they recognized, I think at least, that if they said everyone integrate now and no one integrated, they say, well, we can just ignore the court, right? And there's a cost of issuing an order that goes ignored. We've discussed a few times this semester, right? The court issues a decision, everyone just says, screw it, right? Then the next case, they ignore that one as well. And the next case, they ignore that as well. And then what does the court do, right? There's no basis. So maybe they punted because they realized no one's going to follow them. And I have perhaps some evidence of this, you know, not good evidence, maybe some evidence of this. In the years following Brown, the court didn't take any segregation cases. They were hands off for years. They didn't actually have a real school segregation case almost the 1970s, almost a decade passed by. A decade, 10 years. Lots of stuff happening on the ground. The court didn't actually argue a single case. They did this strange thing where they would simply just affirm these lower court decisions without any opinion. They'd say, we affirm. They didn't set any precedent. They said, we affirm. So those cases from Baltimore and other cities, we just affirm, affirm, affirm. One sentence opinion, two sentence opinions, right? But the court made this broad pronouncement in Cooper and then sort of washed their hands of it and didn't actually enforce their own judgment in any meaningful sense. So why didn't they integrate immediately? Because they realized they couldn't. And it wasn't until a lot of other factors changed, including people's minds, I think, started to change, that you had any meaningful progress towards integration. Um, you still have schools today, in the year 2018, that are under consent decrees. You know what a consent decree is? A uh, consent decree is basically an agreement between the government and a local, federal government and a local state saying, we will integrate, which gives a judge uh, the ability to monitor a school district. In today, 2018, you still have some school districts in Louisiana and elsewhere that are under consent decrees, to this day. To this day. All deliberate speed, we're now what, 60, Three years since Brown? I can't count that high. 60-something years, right? Linda, is Linda Brown still alive? I don't know. I don't know if she's still alive, but some of the Brown kids are probably in their, some of the Brown kids are probably in their 70s or 80s right now who are in that case. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Just to reiterate, this school is still segregated. What happened was, or at least that's what they say when they give the tour of it. They said that um, when this was going on, what ended up happening was all of the white students, they left. And so after it reopened, it's heavily black now. So they're still not, it's not like the dream that they had when they were doing it originally, so. <laughs> yeah, there's a, um, a documentary on Netflix and it talks about the Little Rock Nine and it does say, like, it showcases the schools now and there's literally that school, like you said, is all black and then across town there's a, like, all white school. So it, it just kind of flip sides. But. Yeah, wh what's, what's the name of the documentary? 
So like 1958, um, whatever this case was, to like modern day, I just talked about Brown v. Board and all the other cases. It's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, yeah, yeah. So are private schools, they weren't touched on in these cases, are they still, are they not bound to these rules? So let me, let me just address Drew's point. Um, in the 1960s, Congress recognized that the courts weren't going to get this done. So they started enacting laws that said to states, I'm sorry, said to private schools, if you want federal money, you have to comply with certain conditions, one of which is you have to integrate. So if a federal... Uh, I'm sorry, if a private school wanted federal funding, which is a lot of money, they had to play ball. So for example, this college, right, South Texas, we are private, we're not public, the 14th Amendment doesn't apply here, right, I can discipline you and I don't violate the First Amendment. Oh, my opinion. Yeah, if I'm at U, no, it's true. It's true, at UH, you have certain speech rights that I don't think you have here on the First Amendment. But all of you bring us very nice student loans, which are backed by the federal government. And we take lots of federal money for work studies and the like which means we have to comply by a hell of a lot of conditions, one of which includes uh, equal employment, et cetera. So we cited Katzenbach, right, in McClung. Commerce Clause, Necessary and Proper Clause. So what did the most significant changes for integration was not court decisions, but were acts by Congress in the 1960s. The Civil Rights Act, Title IX. These are laws that actually put strings attached to it, right? The southern states ignored Cooper in five seconds. They just shut down their schools. But if you hit him where it hurts, which is money, then people start playing ball. But I'm taking it there's some private... To this day, yes. To this day, there are some institutions. I don't think they segregate, but uh, I'll give you an example. So there's a case called Bob Jones University. You know Bob Jones in South Carolina, I think? It's a college in South Carolina. Um, and until at least the 1980s, they had certain policies that, for example, prohibit interracial dating. Right? They wouldn't let a black and white, uh, you know, black person, white person date in the 1980s. And there was a question whether their tax exempt status can be revoked on that basis. And the court said, yeah, you can yank their tax exempt status. So there are very, not Oral Roberts, uh, uh, Bob Jones. Yeah, I don't know if Oral Roberts, but Bob Jones had this policy. So you can do. The federal government does stuff about withholding benefits, tax exempt status, federal funding, to get there. They're still not bound by the 14th Amendment, but there are ways of getting around it. But if you have rich enough donors, you don't need public oh. money, right? Yeah. Yeah. Would Congress have done this, though, if the courts hadn't started the ball rolling? I think it's a fair point. I, I, well, well, who started the ball rolling, though? Uh, was it the courts? Yeah, I mean, it's a chicken and egg question. I think Mia raises a fair point. Like, what started it? It's hard to snowball, you know, figure a single movement. I think the courts were an important part. I think Congress was an important part. I think there were a lot of actors moving in a time that was very fluid. I saw a hand somewhere there. Uh, uh, Jesse, yeah. Um, so can, I'm sorry to backtrack, but Please. can you just verify consent agreements? So a, cons a consent decree, like a, like a king's decree. It's usually a school board that agrees to, with the federal government, right? Yeah. Thank you. I saw a hand over there. Yeah, James. So I was talking to my um, father-in-law about this. He's a Hispanic male in his 50s. And he was saying the way they got around segregation was instead of sending 100% um, of white, they would send the Hispanic males over to the black schools to satisfy them. Because so Hispanics are considered white? Exactly. Uh, so it'd be Hispanic and black today. schools, and then they had their white people. Where was this? Houston. Oh, yeah. That's still that's a national thing, though. All right, hold on. Can you your hands up? Just one, yeah, just one at a time, guys. Is that the people who were the majority then are not the majority now. 
and these cases are, have not yet been overruled. And so if somebody else comes in and decides that they want to use this law to create segregation or but they already in the work. Guys, just one time, just one time, finish, thanks. Every people have yeah. to realize that that's a possibility. Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. Kid, our children or grandchildren may be sitting and having conversations about white people being segregated or his, Hispanics not being white or whatever. So I'll be here in 50 years teaching them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we're going to be first in the mix, so that's okay. Um, so to me, it's like, you know, as I, I read through these, I think about them in that perspective. And that's why to me, I, that's why I asked you that question about whether or not they're overruled, because it's mm. not, there's not like a safety kind of thing to it, right? Just because this was the way that it happened then does not mean that when it happens the next time, because it probably will, that is going to look like this. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's a really, that's something to keep in mind, because next time it might be somebody that don't look like this. That's on the other side of it. Well said. Janice, I'm sorry, I don't mean, I, do you want to make a point? I, I don't like an interruption. It's, it's oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Because I, I, I work in education, and when she said that, I was like, it is happening. With the, um, the push for school vouchers it, um, with Betsy DeVos in the Department of Education, so it is. Um, 